Patris et Fidi Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et ora mortis nostri. Amen. Nomine Patris, et Fidi Spiritus Sancti, Amen, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Amen. Brethren Christ, laudate to Jesus Christus. Et in secula. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing excellent. This is Timothy Flanders with the meaning of Catholic. Jesus Christ is King. This is okay. Catholic Empire Part 5 with Luis Medina. Luis it has been a pleasure to do this series with you. Thank you for all of your time and effort. Oh, it's my making pleasure. this happen. My pleasure, Timothy. I'm, I'm delighted, it's honestly, being a true privilege, and uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, so, anytime, uh, I'm always glad to be here. But yeah, this is the last of our series for now, and uh, boy, do we have a lot of uh, information. Yes, yes, we have so much to to go over. Just once again, make sure to check out Luis's work at the Reconquista Network. All linked below. He's on Facebook. He's on Twitter. He's got a YouTube channel. Check him out. A lot of Spanish language stuff as well. So, uh, Luis, anything new that's going on with your channel and your work? Uh, we're doing, uh, believe it or not, in Spanish, we're doing an interview with Professor Barcina tomorrow. We're going to be airing soon, which is uh, one of the greatest intellectuals in our modern era when it comes to history from Spain. Um, I'm relaunching some English series about our faith too. We, we have a, a couple of videos uploaded in our channel, uh, narrated for, uh, for not other, none other than my own wife, Christy Medina, which I sent a huge shout out. Uh, so we're going to do basically putting material both in English and in Spanish. So, you know, it's looking pretty neat. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, just an announcement, uh, prayer request for one of our patrons, Cheryl, lost her home in Louisiana area. Many people have been affected by hurricanes down there. So uh, prayers for Cheryl and her family. Also an announcement, we are starting a new series this Friday, The History of the Occult mm. and its influence on the church. So wow. this is gonna be four or five parts, depending, we'll just see, I think, <laughs> we'll see how long it goes. <laughs> like our series, this is actually the, the sixth part because it was an intro episode and then there's five parts. So, uh, but History of the Occult is happening this Friday, 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. So check that out. Uh, that's coming to a YouTube channel near you. And there is also a playlist for the subject matter that we've been discussing, which is Jews and Judaism. Uh, the all of the text is disguised because YouTube doesn't like anybody talking about the Jews. So uh, the playlist is just called Playlist. So take a look at that. Um, but without further introduction, we've got a lot to cover. We last time we got all the way up to 1917 with um, Satan coming in communist garb to Mexico, to the land of Our Lady of Guadalupe, mm -hmm. uh, targeting Our Lady of Guadalupe first even before Russia because of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And uh, so we touched on the Cristero War a little bit. Where do you want to start first here, Luis? Um, let's start with 1917, as a matter of fact. Um, actually, let me preface this very quickly. In 2015, uh, Pope Francis said a statement in Spanish uh, regarding Mexico, because we were at the height of the uh, violence and war and all that down there in Mexico. And he said, he pointed to Our Lady of Guadalupe and it kind of caught my attention because he said the devil will never forgive Mexico for the Our Lady Guadalupe. The fact that Our Lady uh, decided to show up in Mexico basically put Mexico in the crosshairs of the devil's antics, essentially, which we have seen uh, for the last 200 years. Uh, in my opinion, obviously, not because I, I was born in Mexico, but it is the most important mayor and apparition. Uh, first of all, because he left us a, a legacy, a tilma, like an imprint, literally, um, it's a remnant. Uh, and also because it's a model for our future, which we'll discuss in the end of the series towards the end. But let's start in 1917, Timothy. What happened, as you know, it actually starts with Our Lady of Fatima, believe it or not, you know, gives the warnings that we all know. 
And then uh, in 1917, Red October happened in uh, Russia, the October Revolution, as we see communism spreading. Something interesting happened simultaneously. Co coincidence, you may say. In Mexico, in 1917, the revolution has finally been settled. The revolution was um, uh, in fight, like a civil war type of thing going on in Mexico when this uh, dictator named Porfirio Diaz was in this dying in and leaving the country in power. Uh, people were vying for that power, and all these foreign interests were uh, playing their parts, the Germans on one side, the Americans on the other. Uh, so that turned out into a civil war. Kind of like what happens in the Middle East with the Arab Spring, per se, a little bit. You know, some things never change. Well, the same thing happened in Mexico. So it was like horrible years. Well, finally, they settled with this guy named Carranza. You may see it is the guy who had like a long beard, Moses type of beard, like white beard, um, and adopted the Constitution in 1917. Okay, that Constitution was actually inspired on uh, some modification of the laws brought by Benito Juarez way back then in the 1800s, known as the laws of the uh, reform, which were anti-clerical laws. All right. So back in, in 1917, they're like, okay, we're settled. We have a constitution. And in that constitution, Timothy, shocker, there were some uh, uh, clauses that were anti-church, anti-clerical. It was hard to apply them back then because they just literally finished a revolutionary war, I mean, a civil war inside. So they didn't want to have more fighting with Christians. But the, the, the table has been set essentially for future leaders to take charge of that. Well, uh, after a series of infights and all that, there's this guy named Plutarco Elias Calles. This guy, um, his family came from, is rumored they migrated in the middle 1800s. Uh, it is believed, although uh, it has not necessarily been proven, at least beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Calles' family were Sephardic Jews and settled in Mexico. Well, Caius, when he came to power, which he was, uh, as far as I understand, a Freemason, um, decided to apply what we know now as the Caius laws. But the Caius laws was actually nothing other. Yeah, you've seen that in, in, in your screens. And he's from northern Mexico, from the desert, uh, Sonora, to be more specific. Well, Caius decided to implement the Constitution uh, and give it his own little touch. You know, that 1917 Constitution. And that meant that church was outlaw, as you know it. In fact, he was working to create the literally the own, um, like the Mexican Episcopal Church, sort of like a national church of Mexico. And they thought, you know what, we can pull this. So they tried. That led into an uprising known as the Cristiada or the Cristero War, as we discussed many times. Originally, by the way, that term Cristero was used as a, a negative adjective, kind of like saying papist, right? That we took it and, be, you know, we made it a badge of honor. Well, the same thing with the Cristiada, the, the Cristero War. The Cristeros were peasants, you know, Catholic men that fought with whatever they had. They didn't have all the, you know, weapons and all that. Um... And uh, they started winning, as a matter of fact. It was a very bad conflict that lasted about three years. And in those three years, as you know, they were basically recovering weapons and leftovers, whatever ways they could, they started winning the war. And the government started to lose the battle and they're getting worried, you know. So they uh, sent information. Some of the, the bishops ill informed the Pope. Pope Pius XI, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they bring this scenario to the Pope, saying, hey, Pope, there's going to be a massacre of Christians in Mexico unless you ask them to lay their arms down, you know, to stop fighting. The, the fact of the matter was the opposite. They were actually turning the events. The tide was turning in favor of the Cristeros. In fact, it was uh, to against all odds. Well, uh, the Pope, again, ill-informed, this orders the Christians to, you know, stop fighting, to negotiate. So they negotiated an agreement where the Cristeros will lay down their arms and the government will stop persecuting them. Among the laws, by the way, the Calles uh, promulgated were no public worship, no priestly colors. Like, so if you were a priest, you could not walk out there dressed as a priest. Mass could be only be celebrated maybe every once in a while or maybe once a month. 
if you were lucky. Uh, those who were caught disobeying were uh, jailed, fined, and or executed, um, as we've seen several pictures. And it was a you know, great massacre. More than 100,000 people were killed in the persecution. But believe it or not, the biggest persecution happened after the, the both parties settle an agreement because even though the Cristeros uh, said, okay, no more fighting, they laid down their weapons. Literally, as they allow the weapons, the government will take those same weapons and right there, point blank, will shoot him and kill him. You know, and that went on for quite a bit, actually, uh, up until the 40s, if not. So um, a lot of the churches were burned. You know, the same tactic tactics that for whatever reason, uh, for whatever reason, I'm sorry, the you know socialists and communists, which were infiltrated in Mexico, by the way, uh, use you know, uh, and we'll see throughout history, just like they did in Russia, they're doing it in Mexico, and they will do it in Spain as well. And this is the origin of Viva Cristo Rey. Exactly. That's when uh, people were uh, um, executed. They will shout out Viva Cristo Rey, long link, live Christ the King. Um, it was the first major conflict worldwide against uh, the church, at least in modern history. It's the major crusade, you know, because they were trying to take it as a crusade. Obviously, uh, all the world interests were vested in there. This happened, by the way, between wars, World War One, World War Two, And this is important because all these powers were paying attention to what was going on in Mexico. You have, you know, allied interests and you know, all that. Um, kind of conflicting versions because they don't like the fact that the Cristeros are winning, but at the same time, they don't like the fact that the communists are infiltrated, you know, all the way to Mexico, too. So it was one of those big messes that everybody was taking notes, you know, as usual. And sadly, Mexico paid a dear price for it. Um, one of the things that happened was, Timothy, believe it or not, when I was in school, this chapter of Mexican history was largely omitted. It's it's like we skip by, you know, uh, we don't talk about it. You know, it's just, you know, we talk about the revolution. We talk about calles. You know, we talk about what happened afterwards and the single party system and all that. But we don't mention the Cristero. So you have to learn that outside of the government uh, sources because it's like an unspoken thing. It's like a taboo, essentially. One of the things that the government succeeded was in uh, trying to bury this and most people even in mexico don't know much about the cristero war uh even the fact that there is actually a pilgrimage the um the core of the cristero war were the central parts of mexico particularly the states of jalisco which is where the city of guadalajara is very important place uh the central guanajuato which is where a lot of uh, expats go live you know san miguel and all that area Michoacan, all these areas of central Mexico were the enclaves of, of, of this war and um, other places too, but it was like where mostly were concentrated. And the legacy of, you know, the Cristeros is still here. Had it not been for the Cristeros, Mexico would very likely end up being a communist satellite country. It would be like a Cuba situation, but a lot bigger. <laughs> so the, Chris the Cristeros, by their blood, achieved at least a defense of the communist takeover oh yeah long term yeah yeah no doubt i mean um had it not been for them uh if you if you think venezuela or cuba are a headache imagine having mexico a country with 130 million people a vibrant economy you know and uh and the uprising as a communist or a china type of system that's just a nightmare um, plus, religiously speaking, there's just no possible way. You cannot let Mexico become, you know, in the hands of the communists. It's just, you know, it's non negotiable, in other words. So, when does the flag come in? Well, you see the flags. That's a very interesting question because um, when Mexico got its independence from Spain and started the first Mexican empire, um, we see the emblem of, the, the, uh, of Mexico. We see the eagle, right? Uh, and a lot of people wonder where, where, where did the eagle come from? Well, it comes back all the way from the Aztecs, as the prophecy says, you know, in the pre-Columbian times, that this tribe will leave from modern-day Nayarit, like the east, uh, western part of Mexico, and settle in modern-day Mexico City. And they, kind of like Abraham, built pilgrimage for about um, 200 years uh, before they settle in modern-day Mexico City. And the prophecy said, um, whenever you see an eagle devouring a snake, that's the place you will settle. All right, well, they see that. 
And that's why uh, they kept that and I remember it. Well, hence uh, the, the imagery and all that. That's the flag of the first Mexican empire once they became independent from Spain. As a matter of fact, Timothy, the colors had a whole uh, different meaning originally on that flag. The uh, green meant independence, the white meant religion, the red meant people, okay? Well, the flag, as the Freemasons started infiltrating Mexico, things were tweaked a little bit here and there. And one of those things were the flag. Um, we have no, no, just just so I understand, is this so? Is this the flag from eighteen ten? Yeah, back, back with Hidalgo. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, after that, yeah, uh, after eighteen twenty. Sorry. Um, okay. So, yeah. do you want the next flag? Let me know yeah. when you want the next flag. Yeah, okay. this is in the late eighteen hundreds. If you have it there on screen, and we'll see the same eagle under that um, cactus, <clears throat> and we see uh, he is fighting the snake. Um, but there's a little change here. We start seeing the snake taking a different role. The snake now has um, a prominence, per se. If you notice in that picture, the snake is above the eagle. Snake is always associated with evil, even in pre-Hispanic cultures, just like anywhere else. Uh, and now they're placing the evil, will e I'm sorry, evil will prevail with that imagery. You know, that's the message, essentially. Then we have the modern uh flag which is no pretty, no when when was this flag here this 18 65 18 uh late 1800s mid eight to late okay. 1800s no was this um, okay so this is when the the laws of the reform are becoming a thing yeah choir is already being yeah yeah so yeah. is calles persecuting the the church under this flag uh calles is actually persecuting the church under the modern day flag. The modern flag okay all right let's bring that up so if you can pull there, uh, we can appreciate a lot of it. And as you see in the modern uh, flag, it's also a, um, basically it's a makeup, like, you know, they're tweaking a little bit. You see the head of the snake is still above the head of the eagle. The snake is actually um, in a more advantageous or courageous position, as you can tell. It's looking down upon the eagle as they're fighting. That's not how the prophecy will say it. The eagle was devouring the snake in the original prophecy, even for the Aztecs. Uh, and the uh, meaning of the colors actually changed, Timothy. Originally, like I said, it was independence, religion, and people. Now, uh, the green meant hope. Uh, the white, instead of religion, meant union. And red meant the blood of heroes. So that religious connotation was removed little by little. Messages they're sending to you. This is one of the great tactics that evil uses, Timothy. You know, lies and deceit. And then they use it through propaganda. Uh, and they make themselves look like inevitable, omnipresent and all that, even though they're not. They just set up the scenario for you to be deceived and think, I mean, you know what? This is, you know, both consciously and subconsciously. This is one of those subconscious attacks, by the way. That's not the, 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 the way it's supposed to be. Okay. So the after Pius XI, not really betray, he doesn't really betray the Gesteros per se, because he's he's just lied to, like, I mean, I think it was him who also censured pa uh, Padre Pio, if I'm not mistaken, also yeah. on, on wrong information. So uh, it can happen, obviously, uh, Pius XII was, or Pius XI was a great um, enemy of communism and Nazism, so yeah. uh, certainly a good pope, but uh, it's 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 hard to run a huge bureaucracy. You have to have a lot of advisors, and you can have enemies who are whispering in your ear the wrong thing yeah but with god's grace the cristero so what happens in mexico um later after um this cristero period then what do they accomplish with god's grace a single party system arises finally and cements its rulership which is the one that rule uh, for 70 plus years uh as the americans called it the perfect dictatorship uh also known as the pre until the year 2000 the laws remain, by the way. I mean, it's just that it was a ceasefire, like an armistice, ceasefire and all that. Um, the priests were not able to vote. Uh, they were second-class citizens for the longest time. Even when I was a kid, Timothy priests and uh, legislators were not necessarily in good terms. You know, if there were, like, instances where a uh, priest was walking and a legislator were walking the sidewalk, they will cross sidewalks so they don't cross paths sometimes you know it was that kind of crazy uh, the uh, essentially every free uh, every mason has been president ever since in mexico at least uh, most of them if any 
And then uh, in the 90s, finally, that changed when uh, globalization, you know, uh, NAFTA, as a matter of fact, entered in Mexico. And it was not possible to have second class citizens under the global interest, at least on appearance, right? Uh, we know how that works. And those laws were eradicated, and now priests can, you know, vote and all that. Supposedly now they're equal under the law. NAFTA, not to deviate the topic, but brought also a lot of sort of problems that we we'll okay. talked about. Okay, so so it sounds like what you're saying is that you have the elites who tried to use bloodshed to oppress the church. They failed. The common man, the common common Mexican, is still at least has a religious sentiment. Uh, yeah. Like you have, you know, even in modern day Italy, in places that are quite secular, but there's still a strong religious culture. Yeah. Um, has there been a strong secularization as well in Mexico before before the globalization? We could talk about that later. We'll oh, talk yeah. about. Uh, yeah. Was, was there a strong secularization happening before the globalization came in? Yeah, well, there's a strong effort, to be more specific. And now we're seeing the dividends of that effort nowadays, like in 2020 or 2015, like this last set of years. But for the longest time, I literally remember having and going in public schools and having, you know, sex ed in public schools. All these like, you know, liberal or communist concepts, whatever you want to call it, uh, in the school, you know, like because liberals or, you know, the enemies of the faith, particularly the communists, usually try to infiltrate to education. Uh, I always said it like I never met a, a, a communist that they themselves have like five, ten kids. Uh, they usually don't have any kids, if any. And but they do want your kids. Right. So uh, it's it, I always tell liberals yeah. it's like go have your own family, have your own ten little kids and form your own ten little liberals. You know, don't take my children for that. But no, they want your children to be indoctrinated. Yeah, that's 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 a perfect way to say it. They don't want kids of their own. They want your kids. They want yours, right? Wow. And we're seeing it here in America, by the way. So, <laughs> um, well, yeah. So I want to ask you about modern Hispanic culture. But before we get there, because we've gone through Mexico for most yeah. of the time, let's get back to mainland Spain. Yeah. Because during this same time, the communists come after Spain. Yes. So tell us about that. So Spain becomes a republic, um, even though there is a king, King Alfonso the Thirteenth, is the same king, by the way, that consecrated Spain to the Sacred Heart. Uh, I think it's 1919, if I'm not mistaken. For the second time. Yeah, for the second time, uh, they have a referendum, like a little election, you know, voting things, and the people through the communist infiltration overwhelmingly, well, not overwhelmingly, but a big numbers allegedly, decided to have Spanish a republic and no longer a monarchy. So the king is exiled. Now the commies take over Spain. And they're going along, you know, all this, the, the right wing or the traditionalist, whatever you want to call it, they're just going along. Okay, we're going to play politics. Let's play politics. And as things progress, things are going bad because the communists in Spain started to persecute the people in the church, just the same as in Mexico. They're like, okay, we're going to crank it up. And the situation turned so bad that eventually um, a uh, murder uh, of an intellectual in Madrid, uh, for his name right now on top of my head, led to a uh, bigger conflicts. Franco, in the meantime, was a military uh, general uh, in the Republic, but he was stationed in the uh, Canary Islands uh, in the African Legion, which was the biggest, most experienced legion of the Spanish army. That's a big important factor. As the conflicts broke out, the military, a lot of them sided with the traditionalists. Because you have two factions. You have the Republicans and the Nationalists. The Republicans were heavily influenced and supported by the Soviets. And you had a coalition of anarchists. Um, basically, modern day, you know, if you put together Antifa and BLM and all these things, you know, same thing, nothing really changes, essentially. Um, plus the, the, the support of the Soviet Union with uh, equipment and tanks and all that. So they're starting uh, sacking uh, churches and monasteries. They literally, those guys killed about 8,000 uh, religious people, uh, plus expelling priests and nuns and atrocities that I don't even want to describe, to be honest, because a lot of people talk about like, oh, the Franco, Franco. We'll get to it in a little bit. But uh, um, you see some images, they're like um, desecrated tombs and all that. I mean, they were absolutely horrendous. Uh, in some instances, what they did in Russia pales compared to what they did in Spain. Let me put it that way. It was it was bad. 
Well, in that civil war, Franco uh, takes charge. He doesn't want to, uh, but he rises up to the occasion. They told him, hey, Franco, you, we need to do something about this. And you're the man for the job. So he does. Uh, and little by little, he started conquering. You have two major um, spots. The first one is the cities of Madrid and Barcelona in northern Spain, like um, Asturias. We're leaning towards the Republicans because they were industrialized cities or industrialized communities per se. Not everybody, but most of the people were like more, more Republican leaning. In the Republican side, this is one of the mistakes people make. Not everybody was a communist or socialist. They were Republicans who were pro-church and tradition. They just understood or they thought the Republican government it was in their best interest. On the nationalist side, where obviously all the traditional uh, main two factions that Franco used, the uh, phalanx, phalange in Spanish, and the Carlists, believe it or not. And there are two different organizations that often did not share the same interests. The phalanx has more in line with, uh, it's not the same as the fascists in Italy. They're, they're not exactly the same thing, but they're like a, a, along more of those lines. They could not really, they didn't care very much about religion per se they were not anti-religion they will tolerate it or some of them even embraced it but that was not their thing whereas the carlists as you know we discussed before they're all about religion so franco masterfully was able to put those two together and it was actually the carlists that gave franco the victory in a lot of those battles as a matter of fact the carlists are not so strong nowadays because they lost a lot of blood in that civil war in spain it was they were the ones who gave franco victory franco wins uh, he seizes Madrid after so many three years of bloodshed and battles, and they were really bad. Uh, and then now you have the uh, reign of dictatorship of Francisco Franco ever since 1939, by the way. Okay, so 1939, I, I understand that it was the Carlos who really infused a crusading spirit yeah. into the nationalist cause. Yeah. Now, was there... I think there was an there was some American involvement. As Amer well, right? America was involved. All the major powers, actually, England, France, Russia, uh, Nazi Germany, Italy, Spain became like a laboratory, a uh, social experiment, especially with weaponry. A lot of them tested new weapons. The Nazis tested new weapons in Spain. The Americans, the Russians, um, and this is where the you know Franco was a master of strategy, by the way, because he avoided himself. Uh, any alliance, at least formally, with the English or the French, but he got him to recognize his regime. He also avoided any formal alliance with Hitler, even though Hitler supplied a lot of the materials. He definitely was able to shield uh, Spain from the Russians, uh, the Soviets, to be more specific. Uh, so he never really married, to put it that way, uh, any of those factions. He was just able to keep in, in touch and kept Spain from jumping into World War II, which was a big deal because Nazi Germany wanted Spain uh, as a satellite for their operations. Nazi Germany needed Spain and Mexico, by the way. Uh, the fact is that a lot of Nazi Germans were in Mexico and uh, trying to get Mexico dragged into in Spain. But Franco was able to keep him, um, ward him off. Um, yeah, just, just a quick note. I found um, the battalion, the 15th International Br Brigade, was the Americans uh, organized called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, which was organized by the Communist International. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, history is like paradoxes often. And um, we see that one of the things that mentioned is when uh, in Asturias, in northern Spain, the Nazis bombed uh, part of the Republican enclaves because in Asturias, just like before with Pelayo and, and throughout history of Spain, it's a mountainous region, and it's hard to conquer and deal with, right? Um, so the Republicans had a stronghold there. Franco uh, allowed the Nazis to bomb that area and settled it. You know, he conquered it. And a lot of the Republicans cry foul on that, and like anything else, you cannot justify uh, those means. And at the same time, sadly, that's war. You know, that's why we try to avoid it because there's a lot. Once war breaks out, there's a lot of injustices um, that people just do. I mean, the sinful nature comes full fruition, sadly. Um, what they forget to mention is the Republicans were killing priests and, and faithful people just by attending church. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, if you go to the Basilica of Our Lady of Pillar, the same Basilica that Our Lady, it was not in apparition because he, she was still alive. The same, the same spot that Our Lady, as we mentioned before, Our Lady show up and encourage St. James the Apostle, you know, the brother of St. John. Uh, the same place that the Basilica was built, the same place they sent me this little thing from the Basilica blessed over there. Uh, and the Republicans asked the Soviets to bomb the cathedral, the Basilica itself. The bombs did not detonate. Three bombs landed inside the church. They're in display till this day. Well, with COVID, who knows? Um, uh, display, and they did not detonate. I mean, they were really looking to inflict the most damage. For communism, that threat are not really tanks. You know, we, we all know this. For communism, the battle is spiritual more than actual earthly. Uh, because they can take your house. They can take your weapons. They can take your money. But they can't take your faith. And that drives them nuts. Our Lady of Fatima warned us about that anyway. Uh, but that's a different story. Yes, absolutely. So uh, Franco wins. The, the crusade is a success once again. Mm -hmm. So 1939, what happens through World War II with Spain and after? Spain starts a recovery effort. Franco doesn't get engaged in the World War, but yet, you know, he's in the middle. And that's, to me, as a strategy, that's genius. I don't know how you do that because we're not talking about New Zealand. No, they're, you know, there's respect to New Zealand. They're far off. They can shield them. Argentina, you know, they're, they're like all the way far south. It's kind of hard to reach over there and all that. Spain is in the middle, in the crux of all this good thing going on, allies and, and all this. Um, so they shield up and Franco says, we're going to uh, reactivate our economy. And then uh, start supplying those Catholic principles to the economy of Spain, uh, which a lot of people associated with fascism, but that's a little different. In fact, Dr. Colón, has explained it uh, beautifully in different occasions. What's the difference between Franco and Mussolini and fascism and all that? Well, um, with uh, with Franco, one of the things, the first, there's two stages. The first one is we're going to recover Spain. We're going to make industrialize along with the Catholic principles. Usury was at law. I know that's a shocker nowadays. Good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's our economy nowadays. You know, <laughs> we should see that game stuff thing going on. But anyway, um, Freemasonry was outlawed too, by the way. No divorce, no abortion, things like, well, there's no abortion back then. But like um, a lot of the social issues were protected. The church was um, heightened, per se, like, you know, it was like the, put in a special place. And people started to progress. As a matter of fact, they say miracle, economic miracle. Um, a lot of people often ignore it just because we had a big war going on. But really what Franco did in Spain was truly a miracle. And then he also order uh, after the war scores sadly like any war had to be settled and usually what happens in societies where they have a civil war is the victorious side just obliterates the losing side is we won you lost deal with it you're in ask the indians here in america i mean that's just the way it is well franco did something very very different they're like okay we're gonna review all this uh there were like over twenty thousand death sentence for criminals uh so he pardoned most of them, or some of them had to do like you know pay some fine or do some jail time, and then they were released, but they were not necessarily killed. The only ones who were killed were like the true murderers, like psychotic murderers, the communists. Other than that, it's like they a lot of them they were commuted, uh, and they built this uh, grave site called the Valley of the Fallen. I don't know if you heard of it or not. It's in Spain, outside of Madrid, and it's this gorgeous big monastery uh in uh, a graveyard and had both sides buried there so you have republican uh, fallen soldiers but also you have nationalist fallen soldiers and franco's intention was we're done fighting you know it doesn't matter anymore we're one people we're spain and we both are going to be buried together so the veterans think of it right now, if you put in like, in, you know, uh, Confederate soldiers along with uh, Union soldiers in the same cemetery. And on top of that, you put a big cross, as you see, which is the biggest cross in the world, uh, which is the same cross that the new current government is trying to take down. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's pretty remarkable to have, you know, you wouldn't have a revolutionary war, George Washington Memorial 
with the loyalists who he was killing memorial with that. Mm-hmm. It, this yeah. is quite a remarkable thing, especially because they were Marxist communists. Uh, what a, what an incredible uh, act for Franco to do towards his enemies. A very yeah. Catholic thing. Very Catholic thing. Uh, it's often clearly the enemies of the faith don't want you to see that. I had in my show in Spanish, I'm looking for somebody who can say in English, but I had in show a journalist, which is Estefania Aguirre. It talked a little bit about it. Uh, and I'm actually having Dr. Barson tomorrow in my show. We're going to record it. And we're going to exactly talk about that, as a matter of fact. He's an expert. In, uh, there's about, what, 20,000 uh, s- soldiers buried in that monastery. Um, it's incredible. Um, you see that. And that's where Franco, by the way, was buried when he died in 1975. That's the same place where the current government of Pedro Sanchez, socialist, um, uh, dug him out. Uh, profane in yeah. a... I mean, somebody will say it was a Masonic ritual. I don't know that for sure, but it kind of had all the flavor of it. You know what I'm saying? If you see the the, the ceremony, you know, it looked kind of like a ritual. That's beyond me. Uh, that's for an expert to determine. Yeah, shout out to uh, Redens. I know Redens. I don't I don't know your your full name, but I know Redens is in Spain. And oh, he really? Says, uh, yeah, it's the current Masonic government trying to remove this. Yeah. Um, and, and oh, by the way, this current government, not to deviate a little bit, but really starts with a previous government name of Zapatero. I don't know if you remember that guy when George W. Bush was the president. Uh, he's the guy who really pushed the envelope. And again, just like the Constitution of 1917 in Mexico uh, has some anti-clerical laws, but they cannot be applied because of the current conditions. It took Calles a few years later to apply those. Well, what we see now with Pedro Sanchez really started with Zapatero uh, a few years back when we were a lot younger. Um, But it was just he was not able to push it. But now Sanchez is carrying that mission uh, successfully, sadly. Let me let me pause. I want to pause on the modern because I want to get back to Paul the sixth after. But can you touch on Salazar? Um, Salazar versus Franco at all. Okay, Who was Salazar? Any thoughts um, on uh, Antonio, if I'm not mistaken, Oliveira Salazar is the Portuguese, by the way, dictator, or in Portugal, they were uh, working with Franco. Uh, I suppose, by the way, Portugal by, at that time maintained close ties with Britain and uh, obviously was not necessarily on the very side of Franco. When things settled, um, they worked things together and um, they, they kept Spain from entering World War II. There's another Salazar, if I'm not mistaken, and please forgive me if I am, that was assassinated, who was uh, assassinated by the Phalanx in Madrid. And that was one of the uh, triggers for the civil war in the 30s. That could be the, the ones that they're referring to. Uh, the Phalanx, as I explained already, was the, the philosophy was a little different. The Phalanx um, was, and if you see that with the arrows and all that, that's the symbol they have. Some of them, not all, but some of them even have sympathies with Nazism. And that's important to mention, okay? Um, but it's not the same thing, but you find a lot of them in uh, in sympathy with Nazism, whereas the Carlists have nothing to do with it. I mean, that they, they abhor each other, essentially. So one of them is Catholic. The other one is more ethno-nationalist, if you want to put it that way. Okay. So what happens with Franco going into the 1960s? Um, I wanted to, to read this quote from uh, Stanley Payne. This is actually from... Wemhoff's book, but he's he's quoting Stanley Payne, who's an expert on Franco, and he says this about uh, Franco's economic regime. He says, Franco saw economic liberalism as inherently tied to political and cultural liberalism, and he understood that reliance on foreign investment and international commerce opened the door to subser- subversive foreign political and religious influences. And this is something I'm going to ask you about with uh, Hollywood targeting Hispanic culture later. Uh, but we understand it because um, there's this great quote from, in ni- from 1950, in fact, yeah. from Pius XII in his homily on the uh, canonization of Maria Goretta. He says that there's been a conspiracy against chastity for the past 50 years. He's saying this in 1950 yeah. in the films and in the broadcast. And this is the era of the Legion of Decency where Catholics are trying to force Hollywood to make clean movies. So Franco seems to understand that. Yeah. If he lets all the free market in to just do whatever they want to, they're going to start pushing pornography and all this to try to make profits, which is going to compromise the religion of his people. So 
Um, re- Wemhoff at least sees this as the downfall that comes later. Um, but can you tell us anything about before we get to that? Um, can you tell us anything about Paul the Sixth and uh, the Vatican II and Franco? Vatican II and Franco did not get along for whatever reason. Uh, before that, believe it or not, was uh, Franco was called a caudillo. I forgot the translation. Forgive me right now in English, which of the faith, like a, a crusader of the faith or like a bastion of the faith. Defender of the faith. Defender Defensor of the faith. Of the day. Yeah. Uh, and then after Vatican II, they start having issues. Um I don't want a CUNY set of a contest because, you know, I don't want to open that kind of worms. But Franco was obviously not a set of a contest in any way. He's just had issues after 1960. It's the same era where you had also the Garavandal apparitions in northern Spain. Um, it's also the era where Franco and I talked to an expert on uh, Carlism, Dr. Javier Barraicoa from Spain. Highly recommend if you speak Spanish. I actually had it in my channel, too. And I asked him at the end of the Franco uh, regime, what happened? Frank, I mean, he said that in the later years of Franco, the elite in Spain uh, got this idea. Basically, they became globalists. He didn't say it that way, but I can tell just by the narrative. They, they start thinking it's cool to be against Franco. All these, the sons and daughters of the people who were in the Franco regime, whether as high cabinet members, general, doesn't matter. They started thinking that you know what we're going to be the opposite whatever franco is we're going to be against i've noticed also that attitude in in different circles per se like if uh, if you notice in some protestant denominations you know they won't do certain things just because that's too catholic remember like even though it's even under protestant let's say a denomination specifically logic it does not really violate their own uh, uh, loss or words, whatever, they won't do it just because the fact is, you know, Catholic. Well, it's kind of the same thing happened here a little bit. It's like, we're just going to be against whatever is Franco. And that meant uh, socialism. And they start becoming socialist. As Franco was winning in the later years, he allowed the transition of power. This is an important point to touch, Timothy, very quickly. In a society, uh, at least politically speaking, if a society is in hunger and in need, the last thing in their mind is going to be things like democracy and arts and humanity. They need to clean house, just like any other family. If you have a disrupted home, we can't talk about investments in retirement. And right now, we got to figure out how to have a routine, a healthy routine. What does a family need? Well, that's the first part of the Frank regime. The second part was that transition to a democratic uh, monarch or a constitutional monarchy, You know, that, that balance of power, per se. That's why it didn't happen at the beginning. Things had to be settled, had to be in order. The society had to mature. Unfortunately, as the forces of uh, globalism and the American interest in all these global powers uh, started becoming stronger and stronger, especially the Department of State here in the United States through Henry Kissinger, um, they start breaking that Spanish society and we have what we have nowadays. When Franco died, Spain was like the ninth industrial economy of the world. Now Spain is far from being that. When Franco uh, was alive, uh, Spanish had like really good standard of living. They were safe and it was clean. Uh, look at them now. You know, they're invaded by Muslims right now, like anywhere else in Europe. Let, let, in me, just, let me just read some of this. Um, so basically, Wemhoff sees it following Stanley Payne as um, the original... Uh, there was some court, some sort of concordat where Franco had some say in the way that the bishops were appointed, and he was very he was guarding very much against Marxist clergy. And Which they and, were. And the um, uh, let me see where this is. It, there was a in in July nineteen seventy one. This is reading from Wemhoff eighty eight ninety seven. He says in July 1971, the Minister of Justice publicly of, of Spain publicly protested the Marxification of the Church, echoing the language of a report presented by the Ministry of, of the Interior six months earlier on the penetration achieved by the subversive groups and ideas. Yeah, Bishop Jose Guerra Campos, a former auxiliary bishop of Madrid, came to the defense of Franco, but the bishop could garner support from only 15% of the Spanish hierarchy. And then he goes on to say that the um, there were all these Marxist priests who started to help agitate against Franco. Um, 
And and then November 1975, in his farewell address, Franco says this. When the hour comes for me to surrender my life before the Most High and appear before his implacable judgment, I pray that God may receive me graciously in his presence, for I have sought always to live and die as a Catholic. Do not forget that the enemies of Spain and of Christian civilization are alert. Yeah. And Wemhoff goes on to say that the, so 1978 was the ratification of the new constitution, which yeah. said, among other things, there shall be no state religion. The public authorities shall take the beliefs, of, uh, religious beliefs of Spanish society into good account. Um, but there will be no official state religion. And then he says that by 2010, Spain had legalized homosexual marriage, fast track divorce, abortion, abortion. et cetera. Only 13% of the faithful attend mass on a weekly basis. 56% never attend mass. Um, and he he thinks that it, a big part of it is just opening the doors to that economic liberalism so that all of the big business can just market whatever they like, which just sort of transforms everything into this mind game that yeah. we now deal with, with the heightened technology we now have so, with social media. But yeah. any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to say something a little bit controversial that is discussed among the Spanish circles is a lot of it was aided, let me say, or at least through neglect. Let's put it this way. That when I talk to different people uh, through that transition of power where the king um, allowed that, right? King Felipe uh, of Spain. And so um, that's how some people see it. Whether that's true or not, that's you know, on an ongoing debate, but at least this monarchy did not necessarily put an end to it. He allowed that constitution and that, those uh, uh, clauses, per se. And we've seen the fruits, you know, divorce and all that. We, we, we see what's going on with Spain. It's the same what's going on in Europe. There is, this is a mistaken thing that the devil propagates lies, by the way, uh, that they think that Spanish society is mostly irreligious or atheist. That's not necessarily true. As a matter of fact, we just saw in southern Spain, Believe it or not, Timothy, um, a mayor in a small town in Spain to order, she ordered uh, to, to take down a cross in front of a church, a yellow cross. I don't know if it's on, on the news or not. And it was dumped uh, and disposed of. And the reason they gave is uh, the cross is a symbol of Franco. Therefore, it's outlawed. So the people went and restored the cross. Rebel. Modern, this, this happened like a month ago or less than a month ago. I mean, uh, right now where we've seen, and I had a, uh, a general in my channel, General Chicharro, which I send a huge uh, shout out because um, he is the president of the Franco Foundation. There's a law that they're talking right now. It's called the Historic Memory Law or Democratic Memory Law. Essentially what it means is, is going to censor anything that has to do with Franco in the past. In fact, if you even mentioned it uh, or propagate it or advocate for it, you're going to be thrown to jail. So the interview that I had with him, if that law passes, which is the almost certain thing, if he gives me that interview again, he will be prosecuted and thrown in jail for the same interview. So, uh, uh, so take advantage if you see that content and prom you know, promote it here in the United States. But anyway, so anything that's associated with the cross in Franco, it's uh, going to be persecuted. And that's what they're trying to do. Yeah, and th this is the whole reason we've spent six episodes trying to talk about Spain, because this has been the whole effort of the enemies of Christ yeah. to try to discredit Spain, Catholicism above all, and Spain in particular, because by God's grace alone, not because Spaniards are better than anybody yeah. else, but just because of God's grace the span spanish have full, so much fully integrated the faith in their society and propagated it throughout the world and have done this to such a great degree that they are the enemies of this marxist history and this marxist memory hole as george orwell put it down the memory hole and they erase memories so very very important so um so we we already know there's one attack on Hispanic culture is just to discredit Spain, just destroy the memory of Spain in every way, in every era. How is, how are the enemies of Christ going after Hispanic culture, especially in North America, um, through Hollywood and whatnot? How is this going on? The devil works through propaganda, which is lies. And that's nothing new. We knew that. And as uh, they mentioned before, it never rests, you know, then 
one of the biggest fears they have is the Hispanic society because it's the only society, as you mentioned before, that successfully, by the grace of God, not by virtue of themselves, uh, is has been chosen or set as an example of what the future can be for all of us. So in other words, is Hispanic society is not uh, an exclusive thing. It's actually to be replicated throughout the world. So in order to combat that, they use Hollywood propaganda machines, which the Soviets were experts on, honestly. I mean, people talk about the English propaganda. In my opinion, the Soviets are the best at it, you know, which is lies. Um, and they attack right now in Hispanic societies in this side of the Atlantic by feeding anger. How do you feed anger? You know, in the United States, you feed anger by creating a dialectic, you know, like blacks versus whites or rich versus poor and all that. Well, because Hispanic societies are mestizos, like I mentioned before, you know, different races within the same family. That kind of makes no sense uh, or it's not going to be very successful. You do it through uh, uh, against the faith. Uh, you propagate things like indigenous culture or ethnic pride, and you turn Hispanic culture against things like, believe it or not, Christopher Columbus. You start making uh, movements and ideas and movies about virtuous indigenous people and evil European Spanish people. So you start separating, creating a chasm, to put it that way. Uh, it makes no sense, but it works perfectly because the through the educational system, uh, in, in Mexico and even the U.S., this narrative of you are a poor victim of this Christian imposition from the Spanish uh, has been attacked for the last you know, 50, 60 decades. And Hollywood aids that. So at the fact that is the indigenous people were free people, for example, one of the lies they tell, you know, they're altruists, they're free people, and they were very promiscuous, but it was a great thing, which is not true. I mean, some of them were promiscuous. Actually, syphilis is a quote-unquote gift, to put it this way, uh, the, the Spanish found here in the, in the Americas. But anyway, they, they try to highlight all these uh, uh, moral debaucheries and associated with indig indigenous people, uh, and it creates confusion in the Hispanic culture. So where are, especially in the United States, people talk about Hispanics becoming a more dominant, dominant ethnic group in the United States. It's kind of strange when you, when we do censuses and whatnot, you have to fill out your race often yeah. in the United States for various mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. And usually sometimes it just breaks down as Hispanic or non-Hispanic. It's yeah. like, it's, I don't know why they're trying to uh count all the hispanics or whatever but uh people white say non-hispanic they yeah, say yeah. people often say that uh, the hispanic uh, ethnicity ethnic group will dominate in the next few decades in the united states so how is the hispanic community doing under the regime of this anti-catholic propaganda um, they're thriving. One of the things you mentioned is, first of all, Hispanic has been here in the United States for longer than the United States has been in existence. It's just they have been confined to the south and west of the United States or like anything west of the Mississippi. Um, the difference nowadays when people say like Hispanics are growing so much is because they're going literally everywhere. The United, any of the contiguous 48, uh, even Alaska, as a matter of fact. But um they thrive under adverse conditions. Now, the way that evil uses that, because they see the threat, is these people are thriving. America is not really becoming a Spanish nation, and this never really the intention of the Hispanic community. They adapt and adjust. They retain the Catholic values that distinguish them. Uh, Our Lady Guadalupe is even more popular now because of that Hispanic presence um, than, what, 50 years ago? Uh, and that's what the devil sees, and that's what evil sees. It's like it's the presence of Our Lady here. They don't want that. And the way they portray the narrative is Hispanics are invading, and at the same time, you know, infecting Hispanic communities with you don't really belong. You know, you're a product of uh, an abuse from Europeans and whatnot. It's a multiple you know, different point strategy. Um, but at the end, the Hispanic community sees it like, hey, this is our country too, and we love it, and we will the best for it and it does not require for us to cease being hispanic neither to stop loving america i mean timothy i i was born in mexico and i love america this is the country that gave me everything you know my wife my children in in fact reunited me with my faith my catholic faith 
as a matter of fact. So obviously I'm going to will the best for this nation. I'm not just going to stand by and cross my arms and wait to see commies take over this nation. Um, well, they, they know that. Um, America has the stable institutions. It just needs a mindset that has that cultural root with Catholicism. Well, that's Hispanics, you know, um, and that's why they fear it, um, because as they grow and they take over, it's not that they're going to turn the United States in one big Mexico or one big Spain or whatever, as we've seen it through generations, that hasn't happened, is that the Catholic message is going to keep growing and growing and growing. You have more Catholics now in the South than before. Excellent. Yeah. Um, now, what do you see as the future of um, an Anglo-Hispanic Catholic alliance? Because I, I think that, to me, I, I don't see a lot of Anglos uh, working together with a lot of Hispanics. At least I'm up in the Midwest. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of the Hispanic communities around me are very new, very yeah. new uh, uh, communities, you know, first gener generation immigrants. Uh, but what do you see there, you know, in, in past decades, 1930s, the Irish and the Germans, the Poles, the Italians, mm -hmm. they were in alliance together for the culture, which was the Legion of Decency. And now we have far more Hispanics uh, impacting the American culture. What do you see as as uh, possibilities for that in the it's, United States? It's going to be like Texas. Um, here in Fort Worth, where I live, Timothy used to be Clanstown and used to be a Freemason. I mean, we have one of the biggest Freemason uh, temples here in Fort Worth, downtown Fort Worth. Um, we're now in the double digits here in Tarrant County with Catholic presence. You know, we're used to be single digits. Uh, Fort Worth hasn't changed, has not become a Mexican city. Uh, it was one of the most um, anti-Hispanic or anti-Catholic places you can think of. Look at where it is now. Texas is very vibrant for the faith. It has not ceased to be in Texas. It actually has incorporated all of it and retained. That's essentially what will happen uh, across the country. That's why they don't like it. You know, that's why they fear it. Not, it's not just that they don't like it. They fear it. Um, and there is a reason why it has worked with Hispanics and not with the Irish or the Germans or, you know, whatever in the Midwest. I know the Midwest very well. My wife, she's from the Midwest, German descent from the Midwest. So I'm very familiar with uh, that culture. That's probably why I like Dr. Jones a lot because I understand that German Midwestern mindset quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's uh, I love it. Um, the difference is that, in, in fact, mention, speaking of Dr. Jones, he mentioned it. Uh, there are his words, and I think you saw the video. Uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, one in Mexico, it is the model of what a society should be. It's a mixing society. Dr. Jones said where it takes years, hundreds of years, if not a thousand years for people to, to integrate. You know, And it's a lot of, through friction and wars and bickering. With Our Lady Guadalupe, we had the same circumstances. You have two peoples, the Spanish and the indigenous, who were at odds, you know, at each other's throats. And it was Our Lady that uh, was able to bring those two uh, groups together. And they were not disappeared. In fact, the uh, indigenous legacy was preserved. And the Spanish legacy was also preserved. Well, we have something similar. We look at Our Lady Guadalupe. And say, okay, this is a successful model with Hispanics. It can also be applied to United to the United States, um, but that's the last thing they want you to know. You know, they want you to think it's like this is not part of you. You have no right to Our Lady Guadalupe, which is false. Uh, just like we have as much right or our later Fatima, whatever it is. Uh, the difference is the United States. I mean, I'm sorry, the Hispanics were able to successfully do it. Yeah, well, well, we'll pray for the the reign and the exaltation of Our Lady of Guadalupe in the United States in particular, yeah. and that's a such an important devotion. Here's a few questions. Um, let's see. Thomas Keller says, "Can you tell us about anything about William F. Buckley and his involvement in the Huerta in Mexico?" Victoriano Huerta. It was back in the day, talking uh, World War One, uh, World War Two era, like that. Back in uh, the Revolution, I'm sorry, World War One. Uh, Buckley. Uh, got involved with oil in Mexico. He was that conservative guy that uh, died was in early 2000s, you know, era. anyway. Um, and it was all about oil. So what happened is during World War I, the powerhouses, Germany, you had one, the English one, the other, uh, they were looking for oil. 
And the problem was that the Ottomans had a, bu a bunch of oil through the Middle East, but they were allied with the Germans. So the English were getting some oil from the Middle East, but not a lot. And that was a problem. The other reservoir from oil uh, wells and all that was Mexico back then. So that's the whole point of William Buckley uh, being in Mexico to get oil diverted, not to be sold to Germany uh, and sold back to uh, America and England. That's the that's the whole you know thing going on there. Um, Mexico at that time had one of the biggest, biggest reservoirs of oil in the world. Um, there was this dictator prior to the revolution named Porfirio Diaz. I don't know if you heard of that name or not, but... Essentially, William Taft met with him, I think it was in El Paso, and demanded that he won't sell oil to the Germans, which uh, Diaz said, no, no dice. Uh, don't buy German weaponry. Diaz said, no dice, obviously. Uh, and please, the Mexico at that time was building um, a rail system, especially across the uh, Tehuantepec Isthmus, which is it's like in the little horn, like in the Gulf of Mexico, the southern part. Uh, the same spot that was used by the Spanish when they came back from the Philippines to cross merchandise. Well, the same, they were, hey, let's build a little channel here uh, through railroad. And the U.S. was like, no, please don't do that. We're building a channel in Panama, a canal. Uh, so Diaz says, no dice. And because Diaz refused to do that, well, uh, they had a little Mexican spring, just like the Arab Spring, you know. The same script as you see before, uh, and the rest is history. Well, Buckley was a consequence of that little Mexican spring. Okay. Well, yes, yeah, so that's that is the same script they've been doing for a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Michael says, "What do you think? Who do you think is the rightful Carlist heir? And your opinions on the current King of Spain?" Um, I can't believe I forgot his name right now. He actually Don Sixto, uh, the Bourbon, uh, right now the current Carlist. Um. He has legitimate claim, but the king right now is the king right now in Spain. Um, I wish the current king was a little more Catholic, at least show it a little more. Uh, but Don Sixto de Borbon, the exile, to put it the way, rifle Carlist Catholic claimant to the king of Spain, uh, seems to exhibit more Catholic character than the current monarch. Okay. What do you do? Here's another question. Um, can you tell us about the Sinarquistas? Sinarquista's movement is a uh, national movement, if I'm not mistaken, from Miguel, or Michael, I'm sorry, Michael, my bad, uh, in Mexico, which had national interest or national interest. In Mexico, there's also a nationalist movement till this day uh, that has uh, like an identitarian movement associated with the Catholic culture. And the Sinarquistas are part of one of those groups, among others. Okay. Um, Garibandel. What do you think of it, and do you think it'll be approved? Garabandal, as I asked, uh, it's an operation that happened in the 60s. Actually, a, a movie was made, a really good movie that I highly recommend. Uh, it's in all the platforms that you can find it on. And uh, it has not been approved by the church, nor has been condemned. It's one of those limbo areas, and it happened usually in a very, how can I say, like turbulent era of the church, which was the... Second Vatican Council. I'm not denouncing the council. I'm saying like the conditions that were happening at that time of the church were just difficult. You know, I'm not doing any uh, valid judgment on that. But um, do I think that it will be approved eventually? I, I have hopes, honestly, just because, uh, um, you know, Our Lady finds a way, essentially, eventually. You know, if, if that's true, uh, Our Lady will find a way and it will happen soon or later. Uh, God has different timings sometimes than us. Yes, certainly. Uh, what about the status of monarchism monarchism in Mexico and the rest of Hispanidad? Right now, there are small groups pro-monarchy in Mexico, but they're still divided. You have clusters of people who are uh, pro-Mexican monarchy. Others are pro-Hispanic monarchy. In other words, it's reunited with Spain as one community. Uh, it will take a while to season because the damage done by the communists has been pretty great in, in, in the way we perceive Spain and this side of the Atlantic. Uh, we're working on it. I mean, I'm not working on a monarchy per se. We're working on rescuing the Hispanic legacy. As a matter of fact, there's this left-leaning historian, really good one. His name is Juan Manuel Sunsunegui in Spanish, who even he himself understands that Mexico will not do well until he makes peace with his Hispanic legacy. I mean, it's like I don't care what direction we take, but as long as we don't we don't see ourselves as Hispanic, 
not just Mexican, we will now uh, progress as a nation, you know, period. I agree with that in, in that sense, Mexico will not progress. If I may add, Mexico in any Hispanic country, it has to renounce, it has to be confessional about the Catholic faith. I know that's a little bit extreme to say, I don't care. But the reality is, and the same applies for the United States, we have to be confessional about our faith. We can't just leave it out there open-ended. Yeah, I, I like what, what Dr. Jones said about Our Lady of Guadalupe. He said that the separation of church and state is incomprehensible to yeah. Our Lady of Guadalupe. Our yeah. Lady of Guadalupe just makes that impossible. Yeah. Um, Carlos is asking about the theology of liberation, uh, liberation theology, which is basically mm -hmm. a Marxist a Marxification of the gospel. Um, would you say that liberation theology has been the most successful in attacking Hispanic Catholic culture? I will say so. Uh, more than even the, the states um, trying to do propaganda through television and education, in my opinion, that liberation theology has done a lot of damage, particularly because it has gone to the poorest areas of, in my case, in our case, Mexico, which is the southern part, the jungle, the hills, areas that are hard to reach. And it has kind of spread that um, anathema, if I can put it kindly, uh, among uh, Catholics down there. And he has blurred and confused the lines and he has caused more damage. A, a person, Timothy, at least a Hispanic, we can deal with a hostile government. I mean, I'm, people are crying foul what's going on uh, here in the United States with the current political situation, which is a very sassy you know, scenario. It's a very bad thing. Um, but I've seen that movie before. I don't like it, but I know how to, you know, I can brace through it. I can brace through a lot of things. One of the things that we cannot brace is through theological confusion. That's what the liberation theology does. It confuses. And anywhere that you have confusion, you're going to have eventually resentment and anger. Yeah, it's really, truly a, a terrible scourge on the church, this Marxification, because it is so potently deceptive, yeah. I think, especially to the poor, and yeah. because the poor are suffering. And when you Marxify, Marxify the gospel, yeah. it can lead to this, uh, this poison. So, But here's another great question. Uh, what about many Hispanics turning to Pentecostalism and other Protestant sects? That's an interesting situation because it's happening particularly with demographics uh, at higher rates. And I saw that when I was going through that uh, Baptist seminary. It happens at a higher rates with non-Mexican Hispanics than Mexican. It's happening with Mexican Hispanics too. But um, the highest growth is usually going to be Puerto Ricans and Central Americans. Uh, and one of the tactics they use is community, believe it or not, which is what we lack here in the States. You know, we don't really have a communal understanding. Um, again, with Dr. Jones, I love when he described his childhood, like the front porch and how neighbors talk to each other and all that. Well, that's kind of mimicking a little bit of that Catholic principle of, uh, you know, community. Well, um, the biggest conversions is essentially through that propaganda that is bombarding uh, migrants and saying life is material, you know, and all it matters is the material part. And it's easy to change and switch religions because it's just a matter of personal preference. There's no metaphysical consequences. Right. Absolutely. Well, I, we've, uh, we've come to the end of an, a very long series, Luis. Uh, and I, once again, I thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing so much of your knowledge any final thoughts, if we can make any final thoughts at the end of six hours of Spanish? <laughs> well, first and foremost, thank you very much for having me over. I really, really enjoy this. It's been a pleasure. And for everybody who's watching there, thanks, first of all, for sharing this video and content. And I just want to make sure you see or understand the underlying lesson of this six-part series is hope. It's not about Spanish-speaking nations. It's not about, you know, building great cathedrals or universities or rescuing history. We're not doing a little walk through a museum. The one thing I want you to get out of this series is hope. God always is in control. He intervenes and there's divine providence. It is the enemies of the faith who want to take away that hope. Don't let it that happen. You want to be a rebel nowadays against you know the system? It's not by being angry. It's by praying. It's by being devout. It's by having a family, a Catholic family. You know, it's like um, we mock and we make fun of the Mexicans having like a ton, a thousand kids and 
2,000 cousins or whatever it is. But guess what? That's the most rebellious thing to do nowadays. So by all means, embrace it. Embrace life and uh, trust. Trust in our Lord. Trust in our Lady. Uh, it's there for you. And just don't lose hope. And lastly, Timothy, like we say, Viva Cristo Rey. Yes, I, I think one of the greatest things about Spain is is that uh, that beginning uh, at the pillar because it really started with Saint James mm-hmm. sort of losing hope. I don't know if he, yeah. we can we can impinge that on the apostle, but he was he needed an encouragement, and yeah. Our Lady came to him at the pillar and said, "This country will be a great nation. We'll spread the gospel throughout the world." Yeah, and it seemed to be a failure, and he mm-hmm. left, and that was that. And look at it. Well, our Lady Guadalupe, <laughs> our Bishop Sumarga was worried, sending letters to the king saying, if if nothing happens, these people will die of depression. We cannot do it. I mean, it's, this is not working. And then, bam. By the way, at the same time, you're having Protestant revolts in Europe. And then our Lady Guadalupe shows up. So it's like, um, uh, don't give up. You know, embrace the faith and it will be all right. Yes. And, and I'm reminded again of also of um, Palayo. When he's he's holed up in in the mountain, yeah, and the Mohammedans they've taken over all of Spain, and they send a Catholic bishop to Palayo and to tell Palayo to give up, and Palayo says, "Do you not know that the kingdom of God is a mustard seed?" Yeah, yeah. And there you have it. That's it. <laughs> so it, it is our turn, Timothy, here in America. Yep. So yeah, it yep, will happen. Absolutely, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Luis, once again. Uh, please go and subscribe to Luis's channel. Lots of great content from Luis uh, at his great ministry, Reconquista. For Meaning of Catholic, let's offer up on Our Father and thanksgiving for God's grace to Spain and through Spain to the world, evangelizing the world and spreading the gospel and Christian civilization. And we pray, especially both of us are Americans, we pray for our country, the United States of America. Yeah. For we pray for the reign of Our Lady of Guadalupe yeah. in the hearts of every soul in our country. Let's pray. Nomine Patris et Fidi Spiritu Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster qui es in Jedi, sanctificetum nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra. Pane nostrum quotidianum da nobis podie, et dimiti nobis de vita nostra, sicut in nos dimitibus de vitoribus nostris. And in nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos amalum. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, Empress of the Americas. Pray for us. Nomine Patris, et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen.